insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 52, Financial Responsibility. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, my mature and responsible co-host, Madison Whalen. Hello. And we are joined today with our special guest, Dan Fuchs from The Financial Fix. How you doing, Joe? Happy to be here. Awesome. Glad that you could uh, stop in and talk to us today. Yeah, I've been looking forward to it. Absolutely. So um, just as part of our you know, process here. We like to try to uh, define what we're talking about so that we can keep uh, that in context for the rest of the podcast. So let me just ask you right off the bat, what is the financial fix? Yeah, so I couldn't tell you when, couldn't tell you why, but one day I thought, you know what, I have all these ideas about finance and I want to share them with people. So, you know, through word of mouth, obviously, I share with friends and, and family and whatnot, but I said, you know what, I need to document all this somewhere so I coded and created a blog, a financial blog, and that's what the financial fix is. Um, you know, you can see it's it's personal finance, budgeting, it's credit, it's uh, investing. So I cover basically all different types of topics for, you know, whether you're an adult um, and you know a lot about finance, whether you're, you know, a teen and you might not know as much, um, or whether you're you're a young adult and, and you know, you're kind of just getting started. It's it's kind of covers all all uh, spectrums. So it's, it's, uh, it's a financial blog for, for people looking to learn more about finance, and uh, it's where I share my ideas. Very cool. So what got you into finances and financial planning? Yeah. So, I mean, as I was growing up, um, you know, my grandfather and my dad, um, you know, my dad working for Vanguard, he, you know, a financial investment company kind of got me into it and kind of when I was younger, got me started with this idea of, of investing and saving your money. Um, and, and that's kind of where it stemmed from. I, I opened my, my first investment account at 16 years old and, and that was with the wow, help of him. That's impressive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I saved up a lot of money and I think I, I probably around $500 and, you know, you don't, that's another misconception. You don't need a lot or you don't need a crazy amount, um, right. whatever you have. And I, so I opened it up when I was 16 and, and that's what really got me started with all the research and, you know, everything else. And, and that's what got me started. So nice, nice. Yeah. So today we're talking about financial responsibility, which I think what you just told us is kind of. Right. Kind of the definition of financial right. responsibility, <laughs> but just to couch the discussion today, how would you define uh, financial responsibility? Yeah, I, I think it's a desire and and also a responsibility to, to just properly manage your finances. So it's going to be a combination of everything, right? Spending, what you're spending, how much you're saving, um, what are your savings goals, um, keeping in mind, you know, future expenses, everything. It's just having having a mindset of finance and, and kind of visualizing the whole financial picture. Okay, cool, yeah. cool. Well, I think we've got a number of questions for you. I know Madison has a couple of questions prepared. So we'll come back. We'll take some quick questions, and uh, we'll go from there and see where the conversation goes. Great. Alrighty, so the first section we have is budget questions. So, the first question is, how important are budgets to being financially responsible? Yeah, so so budgeting, actually it's the last article I post on my website, uh, is about budgeting, just because a lot of people are asking about it, and it's a great question. Um, so, you know, basically what a budget is, it's, it's looking at all your expenses in kind of a bigger picture, and, and managing them, and seeing, um, you know, where you can save money, where you should be spending money, maybe where you shouldn't be spending as much money, um, so that sense of organization is, is over time going to save you, you know, a drastic amount of money. Um, you know, let's say, you know, you're spending on a credit card or cash, whatever it may be. Um, when you, when you have that control, then you have a general idea of, of how much you're spending. 
it's obviously going to be tamed and managed. Whereas if you're just spending it and saying, okay, paying it off at the end of the month, um, and you're like, oh, well, how'd my bill get so high, right? Um, you know, it's because you're not um, consciously thinking about what what you're doing um, as you're spending. So what you're spending, what you're spending it on. Um, so I think think that's why a budget's really really essential for whether you know you're a teenager, or whether you're you're 50. Um, you know, everyone needs a budget, and it's it's what saves you a lot of more a lot more money in the long run. All right, okay. thank you. The next question we have is, what are some of the basics to know about budgets and handling money? Okay, so. So for me, the, the goal is to save as much as possible without obviously sacrificing, you know, things that you might want to buy or, you know, things that you love, hobbies you might have, um, you know, because everyone has that, that uh, those hobbies that they obviously want to spend money on, whether it's, Your you cost know, of living expenses. Exactly, yeah. So you have cost of living, you have other hobbies like collecting, um, you know, maybe, you know, trains, whatever it may be. Um, like my dad, he's crazy with the, with the, uh, you know, trains in the basement, nice. um, you know, whatever, it, whatever it may be. Um, everyone has something that they like to spend money on and that's important to factor in your budget. Um, but in the long run, the, the goal is to, as I said, minimize the extraneous expenses, the things that we don't need to spend money on because that money we're saving, um, you know, whether it's a weekly budget, a monthly budget, uh, I prefer monthly is um, that, that money we're saving on the things we don't need is what we're going to be putting into investment vehicles. And that's, in the long run, going to be, be such a great difference. So when you're talking about budgeting, are you right. – you, you say you're talking – you're looking at monthly budgets. Do you generally center the budget around your income or your expenses? That's a great question, Joe. Um, so I don't even pay attention to income. I pay attention to expenses – and then at the end of the month, I, I do see what percentage of the income was saved, but I don't keep in mind, you know, I, if I'm making a little less this month or more this month, um, right, I don't say, oh, I'm going to spend less necessarily. That's a great idea. But what I do is I kind of think of what's coming with the month ahead. So, um, you know, it's February, um, right? It's Valentine's Day, expensive dinner, right? Sure. Um, you know, I, that's money. Of course, I love to spend and never mind spending. Um, but that's something I'm going to factor into my budget. Um, if I'm traveling a lot in a month, right, I'm going to factor in more gas. Um, you know, maybe I'm spending a hundred a month in gas. Um, you know, if I'm I'm driving to Vermont or something, I'm going to probably uh, account for like two hundred, sure, three hundred dollars yeah. in gas. So I kind of look ahead at the month and and like to see what's what's going to be needed for that month. And then at the end of the month, um, you know, if if I saved a better percentage of my income, that's that's phenomenal. So, okay, yeah. that's good answer. Thank yep. you. Alrighty, so the next question is, what are some tools a teen can use to budget their income? Yeah, um, so this is this is awesome because you can't do any of this uh, mentally, right? It has to be written down. I like mm-hmm. to use the term documented, but... Um, so does the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I use a great app on my phone. Um, it's called Money Control. And there's tons of apps like this. Like, I'm not saying you have to use this one. This is what I love, and it works for me. I want to say it was like $3.99. I bought it a few years ago, and by far my favorite app. But what that app does is it, it shows you – it doesn't actively update it, so you have to manually enter everything. Um, but um, not only does manually entering it make you more aware, um, I think, but you can see all your money at a glance. So in all your different accounts, like a bank account, right – um, you know, a savings account, um, your, your cash on hand, maybe your cash in a safe at home or something. Um, you know, all your investment, different investment accounts, you might have the holdings for those investment accounts. It just shows you all your money at once. And that is such a great tool to kind of get in, as I said, just a look, you know, stepping back and taking a look at everything at once. Um, that's kind of what this app does. And, and that's a great tool for saving money to see, you know, tracking your saving over time. That, that app also generates, like, income and expense reports, um, yearly, monthly, whatever. Wow. It's really cool. And it's, you know, you can, as I said, you can be, like, 50 and use it. You can be, you know, 10 to 15 years old and use it. It's, that's, that's great. Um, so that's that's an app, Money Control, I recommend for everyone. Uh, there, there are tons of other apps um, like it out there. I know Mint Personal Finance is pretty popular. Yep. Um, well, Mint, yeah. on, on you know, contrary to what you were just saying, uh, Mint, kind of does a lot of that for you. Yes, they, they do. It reaches out. And and I use Mint for a while myself. Okay. And I found it was one of these out of sight, out of mind things where I wasn't entering those expenses right. in. And and all of a sudden, stuff is showing up that I didn't, you know, 
wouldn't have caught. Right. And and the money starts to flow out a lot faster when you're not on top of it, oh, entering yeah. it like you had said. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I, I used Mint for a little bit, not long at all, probably a week. And I, it just wasn't for me. I, I, like, I loved money control. I love entering everything manually because at the end of the day, I'm seeing what I'm spending and I'm the one entering it. Yeah, you're yeah, exercising so the control. That, yeah, that's why I preferred it. Um, you know, um, you might want something more automated. Um, you know, it's kind of whatever works for you. Um, but, but money control is great. Um, cool. Also, journaling, I, I think, is, is great. Having a journal, um, that's how I keep my budgets. I talked about it in my last article. Um, you know, I kind of write down all the expenses. I write down all the uh, expenses I expect to make. Um, and then as I go throughout the month, I'm going to be writing down, you know, notes. and. So you're doing, like, yeah. projection through the journaling as exactly. well. Yep. Wow, that's exactly. brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I love it. Good answer. Yeah, we can go more in depth later about that process. Uh, absolutely, if you guys want to. So. Sure. All righty. So the next question is... What are some budgeting tips you can give to everyone watching to make it easier to um, basically budget instead of endless like a chore? Okay, yeah, that, that's a great question, Madison. Um, I think write it down. As I just said, that's that's so awesome. So in my last article, I talked about how there are kind of three different types of expenses in a budget every month. You're going to have your reoccurring expenses. So reoccurring is going to be things that are happening every month um, at the same price. So Maybe your Netflix account, um, Disney Plus, you know, something I love to, to pretty much use at least every, like once every <laughs> couple of days when I have some downtime. Um, that stuff's important. Apple Music, if you listen to music all the time like I do, gym membership, you're going to have a lot of stuff that you're paying for every month. So, so that makes a budget so much easier by writing all that stuff down. So now you know, okay, at the beginning of every month, I'm automatically spending X amount of money, whether right. it's, you know, a little bit, a lot, like haircuts, stuff like that. You got to account for that, whether you like to get haircuts. I, I really don't do a lot of <laughs> you haircuts. Know, yeah. 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 See, listen, you're saving money with it. So. <laughs> my, my hair grows like a chia pet, so I'm, I'm there pretty often. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so so the, the first step is to simplify everything is writing down the reoccurring stuff. Um, the second step is, is what I like to call the variable expenses. So that's going to be things that are happening every month, but in different amounts. So this could be buying groceries, right? Um, as I said, buying gas. So I'm gonna be projecting how much I'll be spending in these different categories every month. Um, so kind of getting an idea for them and, and how much you'll be spending uh, per month in variable expense categories. Um, and the third is personal stuff, as I said. So if you wanna buy yourself some clothes, um, account for that at the beginning of the month. Say, Your quality okay, of life stuff. Yeah, exactly. Say, okay, I'm gonna be treating myself and probably buying 50 to $100 worth of clothes or something this month. Um, so stuff like that. If you break it down into those three categories, um, you can use the same template from month to month and it becomes just so much quicker and easier to, to make your budget. So that's, that's kind of what I do. Uh, everyone does it differently, but um, the, the point of it is going into each new month you have a template and, and that's what simplifies it for, for everyone. So, so in doing that, and, and I want to kind of step outside the teen realm here, okay. uh, in doing that, do you use that for end of year taxes as well to go through and itemize your taxes? I do. So I really don't need to worry about taxes right now. It's kind of great. I use TurboTax. So, okay. so basically I just get all my forms from, you know, from investment accounts and whatnot, income statements from, from work and, you know, it, it does everything for you. TurboTax is free if you're in college. Sure. So it's it's nice to not have to worry too heavily about taxes. Um, usually I claim, I love to claim zero on all, all yep, my yep. work papers. So generally you're getting more back at the end of the year, not well, owing any. You, you are, but but right. then, you know, the government's making money off of your money at that exactly, point too. Right, so right, right. Um, that's, you know. The government gets enough of my money. They don't need to make interest <laughs> on it. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, so it, it's for me, it's good. I don't really have to relate um, budgeting the taxes. Okay. Um, but, you know, as, as you said, straying away from kids my age and, and teens, that's that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. So just kind of relate those two and, and account for, for taxes. Awesome. All righty. So, so the final question for budgeting is... What does it mean to live within my means? Okay, this is something I talk about all the time, and I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, so living within your means is is living within your lifestyle, right? So there's kind of three ways to break it up. You're living beyond your means, which is spending way too much for what you earn. Um, living, you know, right on your means, uh, within your means, um, you know, spending wisely. And then there's living below your means, which is really being frugal and really, really pinching those dollars and saving money wherever you can. Um so 
the importance of that is is the fact that you know right now if I really wanted to I could go to a car dealership and buy a brand new Audi if I wanted to and and have probably a ridiculous monthly payment of you know four hundred or five hundred dollars a month. Um, could I afford it? Yes. Um, would it be the thing to do? A hundred percent now, um, because I know that even though I could buy it right now, that money is what's driving my investment portfolio, and that the future money that I'm going to be putting towards that car, that's money that I'm going to need in my in my investment accounts to to help me out in later years, um, whether it's just a savings account or whether it's uh, you know account you have money invested in. Um, you know, living within your means is eliminating those extraneous expenses, the things that you really shouldn't have for, for your current position. Now, you know, if I'm 30, 40 years old and I have a you know crazy amount of money where that's really not a lot to me, then, yeah, of course, it's going to be great to, to buy the car you want. And if it's not going to really affect your investment goals, and that's great. Um, now, living below your means is is kind of what I like to do. And that's where you really start to get financially aware and really start to save the money. So that, that includes stuff like using coupons to get your Dunkin', right? right, um, right. You're not paying for coffee. Um, stuff like that, just kind of sque- using credit cards to, to earn points and uh, sign-up bonuses and, and stuff like that. Um, living below your means is, is where you really start to, you know, to understand that how, how valuable your money is to you and that, that it, c- it could be spent in better ways than on things you don't need and, and-, and put away. I totally agree with you there. In fact, when uh, when my wife and I bought this house, at the time I happened to be consulting, and I was making decent money consulting, but right. it, it was consulting work. It wasn't, you know, I didn't have guaranteed income. Okay. Right. So when we qualified, we had qualified strictly on her salary, and we said, "All right, we're going to buy a house that fits us. Right. That should I be out of work for a period of time, it's not going to kill us." Yeah. Um, and that actually, you know, I had to credit my brother for that lesson. Uh, him and his wife, uh, his wife came from uh, an affluent background, so she had certain standards in what she wanted. Mm-hmm. And they've burned through three houses they couldn't afford to yeah, as a result it's what of that. Happens, so. yeah. <laughs> I, I like to think of like um, when you when you get older, right? So if you're like fifty to sixty years old, you can afford a giant house, no problem. But you see a lot of people downsize because. Right. Not only do they not want to have to maintain all the space in the house, but they don't want to pay an insane amount of money for a house that they don't need. So yeah. even even when you're older, you're kind of living within your means and not living, uh, you know, an extravagant well, lifestyle. Well, and hopefully by the time afford. you get that age, the kids aren't living at home with you too. Right. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's it's such a great question, Madison, because uh, wh- whether you're you know you're 13 or my age, 21, any age, it's it's really important to to understand that concept of of living within or below your means. So I'm I'm glad you asked. Yep. Cool. All right, we'll uh, take a quick break and come back with some expense questions. All righty, so the first expense question we have is, I'm only 13, so I don't have a lot of expenses. What are some common expenses that teens have to watch out for? Wow, great question. Uh, So uh, you are... Um, about eight years behind me. So I, I'm in your place eight years ago. Um, the things I think I spent the most money on your age were, were entertainment uh, expenses. So like maybe going out to ice skate, going out to the movies, um, kind of stuff like that. Um, it's not really, for me at least, I didn't have to worry about too much financial responsibility um, until I was a few years down the line. So maybe maybe high school, that's when you have a car now, right? You're paying for gas, you're paying for insurance maybe, um, a lot of stuff like that. You're paying for the car itself. Um, so that's where a lot more serious expenses, I think, come into play when you're in high school. Um, you know, when you're your age, it, it's kind of nice because, you know, you're not spending as much. You're not really having to worry about money yet, um, even though, you you know, it's great to have a head start on it like you do. Um, but, yeah, for me, at least, when I was 13, a lot of enter- entertainment stuff like, uh, you know, ice skating and, and things of that matter with friends. Yeah. Well, and, and nowadays everything is going to a subscription model with, every, you know, your music, your right, movies, right. your software, everything is going right. to subscription. And while, you know, mommy and daddy may handle your subscriptions for Apple or, well, not Apple TV because they give that away for free if you buy something. But right. Disney Plus. You know, you watch movies on Disney Plus all the time, so we're handling those. But there's nothing to say that you might not have uh, an iTunes account if you want to listen to music or Apple Music, I guess, at that point, Um, or subscriptions to other 
music services or something like that 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 kids listen to. So that's probably more of a recurring entertainment expense right. yeah. um, uh, as opposed to, I guess, incidental expenses of going out with your friends or going to uh, an entertainment like Funplex or the movies or something like that. Funplex is a great place. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We love <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. So it's exactly. Um, it, it's great. Like Disney plus for me is free through Verizon um, for a year. So that's not something I have to pay for right now. Are now um, are you paying for your cell phone yourself? No, so I, okay. I we have a uh, work plan and a family plan, so it, it works out really well. Um, nice. And you know, some kids do have to pay their phone. I, I pay for my phone, um, you know, to, to actually purchase it. Right. Um, but luckily, through our plan, it's uh, I'm still in the family plan, which is great, uh, just because you know I'm still in college, right. still living at home, and and hoping to live at home as long as I can. Um, just to save even more money until I'm, you yeah. know, ready to move out and have a few years' salary in the bank. So, yeah. um, but you know, things like that. Um, it's it's great when your parents can pay for them, but you know, as you get older, some things start to shift. Um, on the your responsibilities, maybe like a music membership or you know a phone bill or stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the next question. Um, I think you sort of answered this, but just for a clearer answer, what's the best way to ensure the money I earn is spent correctly? Yeah, and, and I think even when you're a teenager, I think money is so valuable because you're not making as much yet, right? Um, you know, you're not on a salary with a job. You're not, um, you know, interning or anything like that. So you, if you're making less, what you have is worth a lot to you, right? So um, it's really going to be what you just justify as needs and wants. So... You know, whether when you buy something, if, if you think to yourself, well, am I going to need this in the long run? Do you think it's a waste of money at the time being? Um, you know, it, it's really going to be what you justify, as I said, um, you know, is what you want versus what you need. Um, so the best way to ensure that you're spending it correctly, I'd say, is to, to ask yourself that is, is um, you know, what's important to you? Um, what are you going to get real, real joy out of? And maybe what are you? Just thinking, oh, I really want this bed, but I won't want it in the future. And I think you do that now. You know, we go right. out to the mall or, you know, we go out to, uh, you know, the toy store or whatever. And you look at it, you know, you have an idea of what you want to buy. And you'll spend 15 minutes looking at one thing, trying to weigh whether or not right. you really want this. How much enjoyment are you going to get? Am I going to play with it once, put that Lego together and put it on the shelf and leave it? And you'll walk out of the store after all that time and not buy anything. Yep. Um, and then you'll save the money. Yeah. So I think you've you've pretty much nailed that one. Yeah. yeah, I definitely think I've gotten better with my financial responsibility because before when I like was on when I didn't have chores and I was like I don't know, nine and ten, um, I didn't have a lot of money. I only got it from like birthdays and stuff. Right. But now that I have a chore that pays very well, just saying. Um, For an hourly rate, yeah, you're, yeah. you're making some good money, trust me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've definitely um, now realized that I need to focus and figure out, am I really going to want to have this? How much enjoyment am I going to get? All, All right. that other stuff. Right. And I, there's a, I think there's an appreciation you get when you work to earn the money. As opposed to when it's even just gifted to you. Absolutely. Yeah. You look at it completely different when there's an expense. I, I always feel that way. And, and a couple of things I'd, I'd love to add, Madison. Um, you know, you, I'm the same way with that, right? I'll spend forever looking in a store at something, you know, maybe I'm between two items. Maybe I'm like, if I need it at all, right? So that's great. You think that way. You think, well, do I really need this? Or is this kind of just me saying, ah, I want it? So that's great. Yeah. Um, the second you mentioned, I think it's great to, you know, before you're, of, of the age to have a job, it, it's great to have chores and, and to be able to make a little um, income at home. And, and that's great. And then, as you said, the other only really income a teenager has is like birthday and Christmas, right? Um, so this is obviously different for everyone, but I would never spend a penny of what I made, what I, what I got from family or, or friends and whatnot on birthday and Christmas. That would be my money that I just take and put away yep. for my for my investing. And it builds yeah. up. It, it, you know? So that way, when I was sixteen, I had a lot to put in. And, yeah. You know, and yeah. you know, I, you know, with my initial five hundred dollars, I as I learned, I put more and more and more in, and to have that money readily available, you know, by the time you're sixteen or even younger, it's it's great. And so that's that's kind of how I got that from kind of just saving gifts is is a great idea uh, when you're younger. Awesome. Alrighty, so the next question. 
Um, I think we also sort of answered this, but just for a nice clear answer with a new question. Well, yeah, I think we did. So the next so, question that we okay. had was was handling recurring expenses, and and I think we covered that one. Right, right. Um, I think the next one's a good question. Okay, so the next question is, how do I know if I have too many expenses? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, so, so Joe actually talked a little bit about that. Um, you, you asked me if when I budget, I compare it to my income. Right. So if you're making, let's say, you know, $1,000 a month and you're spending $950 a month, something is not right. <laughs> um, either you need to be making more or you need to be spending a lot less or both. Um, so, so when you find that you're really not able to save at all, um, that's when there becomes a problem. And that really is, um, that's a reality for a lot of people. Um, I don't know if you know this, the average net worth of a 21 year old, can you guess how much that is? So how much a 21 year old is worth is $0. Wow. So there, that means their assets and their liabilities just because of so much college debt is actually canceling out or becoming negative. Wow. Um, so that's really scary to think that not everyone is in a great financial position when they start out, and that's because of college. Yeah. And, you know, that's a reality. And, you know, the way around that is is to, you know, obviously you say, okay, well, I have college debt, but the first three years out of college, as soon as you get out of college, start making the money, start paying off the debt. And, and again, budgeting comes into play with that to, to make sure you're saving enough to pay off that debt as quickly as possible. And then you, and then you could start to begin to become on track for, uh, you know, for, for saving for your investing accounts. So Very good point. Yeah. All righty. So for the final question in expenses, I think it's a pretty good one and an important one for pretty much everyone watching, not just teens like myself. Um, should I prioritize which expenses I pay first? Yeah, so, so anything that you're being charged interest on, especially um, if you're an adult, you need to get rid of that right away. So um, I, I, one thing we'll t probably talk about in a little bit is credit cards, right? I pay the statement in full um, every month, so I'm never being charged interest on credit cards. If you have any type of loan or maybe a credit card balance, maybe college debt that you're being charged interest on, so that means you're being paid um, I'm sorry, you're you're um, being charged more and more the longer you don't pay it. That's what you need to pay off as soon as possible. That's what you need to do before you start the investing accounts and everything like that. Um, you know, you need to get that money paid off. And so th that that is always the first expense you pay off. Um, if we're just talking about monthly expenses, um, you know, after you get paid, I think it's, I love the idea of pay yourself first, which I'm sure um, you've heard of, yeah. um, you know, putting the gas in your car, making sure you have the, the groceries at home for the, the week and the month. Um, just the important stuff first before you go spending money for yourself and, and putting the money away. Yep. Before you invest and, and maybe put in the savings, make sure you're taking care of at home with, with things like that, I'd say. And your, so, sur your survival yeah. expenses, right. basically. You know, the making sure there's there's food on the table, making sure the electric's paid, making sure you can get the work so that you can make money for the next month. You know, yeah. all the basics, I think. Right, and, very and, and the very, to me, the very scary thing is that, that, with investing as we begin to talk about investing more and credit more, um, none of this stuff is taught in school. Yeah. And that is just mind boggling to me that, yeah. that, you know, that I learned all this through the past five, six years on my own. Nothing, yeah. you know, nothing you do in school, you have, you have financial literacy in 10th grade. That's a half a semester course that mm -hmm. honestly you learn absolutely nothing in, um, as opposed to what you should be learning. Um, you know, especially when there's so many young, young teens and, and young adults, uh, you know, battling college debt and, and other crazy living expenses, uh, day to day expenses. It's, it's not that they don't teach you, you know, you know in school. It's funny you mentioned that I was, I was just in the process of cleaning out my, my desk downstairs to put a new desk in and in going through it, I came across a box of very old stuff. <laughs> and in that box, I happen to have a plaque that I had earned when in high school um, from for National Honor Society for Outstanding oh, right, Achievements okay. in, yeah. in Business. And that class did all the budgeting, showed you how to manage a checkbook, yeah. showed you, told you about investing, right. and they don't offer anything like that no, in no. schools today, which it's, is It's crazy because it's so easy, to be honest, that everyone can do it and everyone could be you know, doubling their money every 10 years. Yeah. And and they don't realize the effect that has by the time you're, you know, you're 60, ready for retirement. It makes a drastic difference. And, and we'll, we'll go uh, 
more in detail about that uh, later in the episode, I'm sure. Absolutely. So we'll come back and we'll talk about credit since that seems to be a, a hot topic. Cool. So basically starting off with our um, credit section of this podcast, um, is credit important? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know what? I'll bounce that question right back to you. Like, so I, I want to know as a teenager, do you know what credit is? No. And it's okay to say no. Perfect. So credit and credit worthiness, credit is basically um, your likeliness to, to pay back a debt, right? Um, okay. So, you know, if you have an established credit, um, you're going to be offered better interest rates. Um, I know this might sound complex to you. But mm-hmm. to put it in layman's terms, right, um, you know, it's your ability to pay back money that's given to you, right? So it's whether you're a risk. Exactly. Whether you're a liability or a, a company can trust you, a, a lending company, credit card company, an auto company for buying a car. Um, it's, it's whether they can trust you. Exactly. So if I give you $20, what are the chances that you're going to give me that back over right. a period of time? Right. Mm-hmm. So let's say I, I do give you $50 and I say, okay, in a month, uh, give me 50 back. And, and you never give it to me back, how likely am I to give you $50 again, right? Right. Not too likely. So that's yeah. that's what the idea of credit is. Um, is it important? 100% absolutely. Um, you're going to need, you're not going to need to worry about credit too early on in life. Um, probably around your early mid 20s is when you start to need it for things like car payments, home payments. Um, but the important part is having it ready for when you need it. So that's when you're going to start building the credit when you're 18 through credit cards. Um, establishing a good credit score, um, which really doesn't require a lot at all. Um, it doesn't require you to, to, to spend money that you wouldn't spend. Um, so, so establishing good credit is is important for when you need it in, in the mid-20s. So, absolutely. All righty. Well, I think it just answered like the next three questions. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. All righty. So I moved down through questions. Uh, yeah, so I think we want to ask, and I'll ask this one, um, are certain credit cards better than others? Yeah. So um, as you start, I- I'm a little crazy. I'm going to be honest about credit cards. I'm a little crazy with them. Um, you know, people say credit cards are a bad thing, and I agree with that. If you do not know how to manage your money and you cannot control yourself, credit cards are not for you. And and I've I've heard of people that just, like, max out their credit cards, and then they're paying all this interest and all this debt, and it's a nightmare. Yeah. Um, that's not how you use credit cards. How you do use credit cards is you use them to, to spend money that you're not going out of the way to spend that you're going to spend anyway. So if you are paying that streaming service uh, for that streaming service for Disney Plus for Apple Music, um, if you're buying something at the mall, when you're putting it on the credit card and paying it back at the end of the month, it's a lot better than using cash just because – now it's showing the lender that you're you're able to pay back your debts. And starting that, at as I said, the age of 18, I think, is when you could start to open a card yeah. um, by yourself. Um, starting that at 18 um, is really important. Just start building the credit for, for your later years. Um, so back to the question, are certain ones better than others? Absolutely. So different credit cards have different perks. Um, that gets really, really in-depth and extensive Um, The idea, essentially, to explain to a teenager of cashback is, um, you know, for every $100 you spend, they'll give you a dollar back. So instead of spending $100, you're spending $99. Um, There are credit cards you can use for gas. So you're saving 5% every time you swipe your credit card for gas. So, you know, every $100, you are getting $5 back. And that adds up over time uh, in in the form of rewards. So, you know, I I can't tell you I'd probably save hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of dollars just from using credit cards, not spending any money that I wouldn't spend anyway. I'm not like crazy and say, oh, I need points uh, or anything like that um, through sign-up bonuses and, and things like that. Um, depending on what you want, they're, they're perfect credit cards for you. Um, you might just want one credit card that that's 2% cash back on everything. And that way you don't have to go crazy tracking rewards, um, which which I think is what a lot of people like to do, just have one or two. Yeah. Um, or you can be a little crazy like me and you can go, you know, have a few different cards for, for different scenarios from month to month. Um, I, I probably have about six or seven, and I use at once usually two or three every three-month period. Sure. Because uh, that's when that's when the rewards, the, the rotating rewards change. So yeah. so I read your article on okay. uh, the financialfix.co and uh, the article on uh, the Apple card. Right, yes. Uh, so I have an Apple card. Okay. Uh, I use it rarely. 
Okay. Um, primarily, I use it for anything that I purchase from Apple at this point in time. Which is great, yeah. So I get the 3% back on right. that. yeah. Um, it, a lot of it's gimmicky. Okay. So, you know, the whole next day cash back reward type thing. Mm-hmm. I totally agree with you that I'm not spending money to the point that I'm looking to get that back every day. Right. Um, and nor am I using it enough where the analytics work. But... What's, to me, I think advantageous for, for something like that is for online purchases. One of, the, one of the biggest advantages I think the Apple Card have, and some of the cards that are out there today are offering this, where you can generate temporary account numbers. Right, yes. So every time I make a purchase online, I can generate a different account number for that purchase. So if right. it becomes compromised or their database gets compromised like we see you know, on an almost daily basis... That isn't going to hurt me. How do you uh, yeah. weigh those factors in uh, to credit card? Yeah, so I mean, you, you've had so many, especially being I'm a computer science and cybersecurity student. So you know, th- there's so many data breaches nowadays. You know, wah wah, millions of dollars, mo- a lot of customers with credit card information. Target, um, not too long ago, had a huge data breach. Um, protecting your your um, your money and your privacy is important. Um, and the fact that when you use Apple Pay for not even the Apple card, but but any credit card, right, it's it's generating a different hash every single time you use that card. So, um, you know, if they're going to hack your data, um, if they're going to they're going to get access to the data, they're only getting that one transaction. They can they can get only one piece of the big puzzle. And right. They can't get any of your other stuff, which which is great. Um, I, I mean, the I think the the worst thing to do is actually use physical plastic. That's what's actually if you're actually swiping a car without using a chip, um, that's what the, is the least secure, obviously. Um, right. And then my, my pa- it just happened to my parents. They had to get new uh, Chase Freedom cards just because uh, they, they had a couple expenses on there they didn't, they didn't have, and they yep. had to change their numbers up. And so it, it does happen to everyone. Um, you know, I, I always like to be very cautious with I, I never save my credit cards on my computer. I don't like to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I try to use Apple Pay whenever I can uh, just for that extra layer of security and absolutely use a chip whenever I can because it's it's way more secure than ever having to swipe your card. So. Okay. Yeah, cool. great question, though. All righty. So the next question we have is, how do I learn about which credit cards are best for me? Yeah, so so the internet, I say, is your best friend. Um I, I there's this YouTuber I love, uh, Graham Stephen. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He's mm. a he's a millionaire. Um, I think living out in California. I don't hang out with too many. Um, <laughs> 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 well, listen, neither do I. But um, yeah, he is um, real estate investor and and really great guy to to talk about credit cards to you and and how to use them. Um, so I I love watching his credit card videos and stuff like that. Um, but any like Investopedia um, is one of my favorite websites for okay. kind of just basic uh, descriptions of things. If you're looking to learn more about credit cards, um, it's always a great idea to just go to Google, type in you know X credit card, maybe discover it card is a great uh, starter credit card that I love to recommend to people. Um, going online, just kind of learning more about it and, and looking up the perks and the rewards is how you're going to get an idea of what you want. So. If you're, let's fast forward a few years, let's say you are 18 years old um, and you're looking to get your first credit card, right? Um, You're just going to want something really simple, really basic that you can start to establish and build credit with. So that's when I recommend um, either a secured credit card. um, If you don't have a credit score and you need some help getting one, Um, a secure credit card is basically when you you deposit money into the credit card account. And that way, if you don't pay it back, it automatically does for you. So it's kind of like a learning curve for using a credit card. Um, if you don't want to get a secure credit card, you can start out with, um, I know Capital One has a journey card where it's just kind of 1% cash back on everything. Um, but it's it's just a great card to start building credit with. Same with Discover It. It's just 1% back on everything. Um, but they also double your cash back at the end of the first year. They also have 5% back on rotating categories like gas and dining. So the reward spectrum really starts to grow over time. Um, and, and as you start to get more of an idea of, of kind of what you want in a credit card. But, um, you know, I think if you're just looking to establish credit, really – your goal should be to get a credit card that earns 2% back, um, which which everyone should have, I think. Okay. Yeah. All righty. So the next question is, how do I get a credit card without credit? Okay, yeah, great question. So I, when I applied, probably about 18 or 19, 
um, I, uh, my first credit card was the Discover It card. Um, and I, I guess maybe I had a previous credit score, but you never really know, I guess. You're, I'm not, there are no loans in my name or anything. So right. there's really not a reason for me to have a credit score. Um, they are a company notorious for, you know, giving credit cards to um, people with low or, you know, coming into the world of credit. Um, so you want to look for companies like that that do that. Discover is great for it. Um, you know, if, again, if you don't have the credit score, um, Capital One Journey is an amazing one. Um, they also have a card that just doesn't earn any perks. It's just you charge it and then you pay it back. And sometimes that's what you have to use um, if, if you don't have a credit score. But once you get that first card and you start making your payments on time for a few months to a year, um, then you're going to start establishing a credit score and, and start to be able to expand your, your credit card uh, game. How do you feel about department store credit cards? They used to be years ago when I was getting into credit – that was your entry level. You know, okay. that, that was how you got a credit score because you weren't getting credit cards if you were fresh out of high school, you know, from the major credit cards. So mm. you'd get a Sears card or, right. or a JC Penney card and that was how you got your credit established. Is that still viable? I mean, I, I really don't know people that, that use them. Um I know for a fact I don't. Um I just kinda like the generic no annual fee um cards that are gonna maximize my cash back. So you know, for a kid my age, I'm looking for things like two percent back on everything with the the um, uh, what is it, the city double cash back card. Okay. Um, you know, I'm looking for five percent back on gas quarterly. I get three three out of the four quarters of the year. I'm earning five percent back on gas. So I'm looking just for things that are maximizing my cash back. Um, the what only about let me uh, let me interrupt you for just yeah. a second there. What about interest rates? Yes. Do you shop for an interest rate? That's what used to be the traditional philosophy with credit cards. Yeah. Um, so an interest rate, um, to explain um, to a teenager again, Madison, is um, if you're not able to pay your balance at the end of the month, it's how much extra they're going to charge you for carrying that balance into the next month. Um, I don't care if a credit card I get is 1% interest or 99% interest because I am paying it off at the end of every statement um, in full. And so an interest rate is really not, uh, something I never pay attention to. Um, now, I'm sure there are credit cards out there that have really good competitive interest rates. So maybe if you know you're going to be charging something like a very large expense um, you know, on a charge card or something along those lines, uh, maybe that's something you look into as an adult. But again, I, I never would promote um, using an interest rate. I'd probably recommend just getting a loan at that point. Okay. Um, because you're going to get a, a lower interest rate with a loan, I think, than probably you would through a credit card lender. So Makes sense. Yeah. Good segue, too. Yeah. So we're about to talk about loans. So I'm just okay. going to combine the last two questions. So yeah. how do loans work, and what are, and are some loans better than others? Yeah, so... Are some better than others? Absolutely. Um, so that's all going to depend on your credit worthiness. So if you have a better credit score, um, let's just use the example again of buying a car, right? Um, let's say I go out and buy that Audi a few years from now. Um, I don't you even got that. I, that I, don't, car, I don't even huh? like Audi. I don't know why I'm saying Audi, <laughs> but um, so let's say I'm going to go buy that a few years from now. They're going to look at my credit score and they're going to say, okay, he has a great credit score. So we are going to lend him money and charge him less. So maybe the interest rate is 6% over a fixed period of time, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a really good interest rate. Um, for someone that doesn't have that good of a credit score, um, they're going to charge a lot more in interest. So they're going to charge maybe 20% or something like that. So not having a good credit score is going to cost you more money if, if you're going to need to take out loans. Um, for college loans, which are obviously very important for kids my age, um, again, you're going to you're going to need to look for the the lowest rate available through your school or through any third party college uh, lending service um so um just because how essentially how a loan works is right you're let's say you have a $10,000 loan so a company's giving you $10,000 but they're going to ask for $12,000 back so that's where that interest rate comes in it's going to determine how much you need to pay back over a given period of time whether it's 2 years 3 years it, it varies per loan but um yeah. And they'll amortize that loan too, so that right. you'll be paying mostly interest the first half of the loan. Right. So the bank gets their money first, and then the principal, which is what you actually borrowed, 
you'll pay this on the second half of the loan there. Yeah, the yep. thing is, I actually learned this, well, I learned about principles, income, all that stuff in math when we were doing math problems on how to calculate interest, yeah. principal, nice. and the time and rate, basically, like... Oh, good. So I'll leave it up to you and we refinance the house. <laughs> so some, yeah, to answer, some loans are absolutely better than others. The lowest interest rate possible is, is most likely, um, in most scenarios, going to be the best loan. Um, and again, that comes from having a good credit score. So. All righty. So, all right. So let me ask a counter question there. So you okay. can get a fixed rate or a variable rate. Right. I can get a lower variable rate today than I can a fixed rate. Is that a good, is that a good move? I mean... So, so I, I'm very fortunate. I don't have to worry about loans. Um, it's <laughs> yes, you are. You will, oh, you will one day. You will one day. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, a fixed rate is great because I assume you, you know what you're going to be paying over X amount of time. Right. Um, you know, variable. It's going to to be a little different. Um, I, I mean, for that, I'd probably just say that whatever. You know, it, put it as simply as possible. Whatever you know for certain is going to cost you the least amount of money. Yeah. Um, you know, when I'm when I have to go into to knowing about a lot of extensive stuff for loans, um, you know, whether it's uh, for for a mortgage for stuff like that, um, I'm really going to do my homework and make sure that I that I know, um, you know, historically and you know, um, in today's day and age, how I'm going to spend the least amount of money. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Good. Same with, same with investing. I mean, right? Um, uh, wait, wait, wait. Don't, uh, not, don't not get, get not, All right. We'll <laughs> we'll, jump the gun there. That's cool. our next segment. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I think we'll come back. We'll talk savings, then investing, right? Yep. All right. So pretty sure we already answered the first question a while ago. So we probably can breeze over that. Okay. And that was about what is, you know... Why would you? Why should you be concerned about saving money? Right. And you should be. So. Absolutely. So, what are good ways and bad ways to save money? Okay. Yeah. Um, a bad way, I think, is just keeping money in a bank account or at home um, as cash. I, I always like to say that a bank account is essentially just a prison cell for your money because. Yeah. Or it's it's just as good as being at home in a safe or you know in your piggy bank, right? It's not making you any money. It's not making you any passive income, um, and that's not good. Um, there are tons of savings vehicles, not even talking about investing, that that you can use to make a guaranteed um, APY, which is um, interest that you're earning, not that you're paying. Um, there are tons of high APY savings account. I know Goldman Sachs, Barclays. Um, so what's APY stand for? Um, annual percentage yield. So okay. that's that's going to be per year how much you're making. Um, so if you have $100 and the APY is 2%, you're making $2 a year. Um, that's $2 a year you wouldn't have if it were sitting at home. Now, that's a very small scale. If you have a lot more money than that, obviously that's going to tally up. Um, again, to, to be making you know, an amount like 2% a year, um, in the grand scheme of things, that's not a lot, but that's because there's no risk involved with that. That's going to be a guaranteed profit per year. Um, so there's safety in that guarantee. Exactly, right. So so normally, um, you know, with, with savings vehicles, you're not going to have any risk, but you're going to have also with that low risk, a low reward. So, but yeah, I, I love to encourage uh, for people that aren't quite ready for investing, um, high APY savings accounts when, when you're younger. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty, so the next question is um, a little, it varies between age, I'm pretty sure, so how much should I save? Yeah, I, I don't think this question is as much about amount as it is um, percentage. So, um, you know, let's, whatever you make throughout the year through your chores, right, um, through, through birthday and, and Christmas and things like that, um, those gifts... You know, essentially, I know they're gifts, but that's income. Um, so, so you should be looking to save a very reasonable amount of that. Um, you know, again, it's going to vary from person to person. So you're not going to be looking to save like X amount of dollars um, every year, but you want to make sure your percentages are high. So maybe when you're when you're bringing in this income, let's say per week you're making fifty dollars from chores, which is which is a pretty darn good paycheck, I think. Um, so 
you want maybe want to save thirty dollars, right? And then maybe twenty dollars for for expenses. So you want to the the goal ideally is to save as much as possible, even over fifty percent, um, which which sometimes can be realistic and sometimes can't. At your age, it, it absolutely could be realistic. So your priority should should be heavily in the saving part, and then maybe twenty five percent in the spending part, seventy five percent in the, in the uh, saving part. Alrighty. And I think you're you're pretty spot on for that. I think right now we're doing uh, fifty fifty right now. Good. That's perfect. Um, and the 50 that she's not putting in the bank, she's not spending either. Yeah. So she's sitting on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's a great thing because, you know, a lot of kids your age, I can tell you, do not do that. Yeah. They're, they're going to be getting money and just going out and spending it right away. Yeah. And, and the fact that you have that financial awareness at 13 years old is phenomenal. Um, you know, that's that's not something a lot of kids have. And that's something that's definitely important and special uh, down the line. So that's awesome. Awesome. All right. Alrighty, so the next question is, when do I stop saving money? Never. Absolutely never. <laughs> I was just going to say, if I ever do. <laughs> yeah, um, you, you, any age, you, you're always going to be adding money to your portfolio, um, your savings account, your bank account. Um, it never stops. Um, it's something that's important your whole life to, to start saving for retirement. And, and you know, hopefully... the. You know, ideally, the younger you start, the earlier you retire. And you know, whether that's a difference of a year or a few years, that makes it, in the grand scheme of things, an, an awesome difference. Um, so, so saving money never stops. It should always be a focus and a priority. Um, obviously, I always love to say money is obviously not everything, um, right? But it's very important to keep in mind that um, you do need it for for the things you want, the things you need. So, so that's that's why saving is important, and that's why it never stops. Good answer. Yeah. I agree. Alrighty, so the next question is, can I lose money through different saving types? Yeah, so um, Joe, maybe you want to pick my brain a little bit with this, but I'm I'm going to initially say like savings accounts. Um, I don't really think so. I couldn't think. Um, um maybe you can counter me, um, here, but um, I don't think there are any savings accounts that are unsafe. Investing accounts, absolutely. Right. Um, you can absolutely lose lose money with investing. Um, the only what do you time, think about that? the only time I think you run into any risk of loss is in huge amounts. FDIC insures you for what up to five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So, yeah. So even if the bank that you have money in goes under, the federal government actually insures that money. Mm-hmm. So unless you go over that. Uh, insured amount, you're not risking anything with right. a savings account, mm-hmm. and that is why your right. interest rates are so low. Yeah. So no risk, little reward. Yep. High risk, generally high reward. Yep. Yeah, and I think if you have five hundred thousand dollars in a savings account, that should probably be invested. Not, well, not and if you have five hundred thousand dollars in a savings account, you're probably not that bad off to begin with. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> Next question. Alrighty, so this goes into what you were starting to say, but into more depth. What is the difference between savings and investing? Yeah, so they're they're both similar and they're both different, right? So they're both taking your money and right your harder money and you're putting it somewhere. Um, the the real difference comes in where you're putting it. Um, so a savings account is typically going to be through a banking company. You know, every every bank has as a savings and a checking account. Um, obviously checking being for spending and and savings being for putting your money away. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, on the other hand, an investment account uh, through a brokerage, which which we'll talk about, is where we're putting our money into a market. The the real world, you know, moving every day all around the world market, where we're going to grow our money based on the values of, of funds, of companies, um, of other of other markets. Um, so that's where it differs, right? We're putting with investing. We're not just putting it into our bank account. We're putting it into the stock market, and we're now we're really starting to make our money work for us. So, th- so that's where the difference comes into play. Difference comes into play. All right, cool. Alrighty. So the final question in savings is, how do multiple streams of income affect savings? Yeah. So. Um, a topic I love to always touch on is is creating multiple streams of income, right? Um, so if you're you're doing chores right now, um, that's great. You're making great money. Probably at this age, that's your only stream of income mainly. Um, I guess and, you can and count. report cards. Okay, she gets so, paid for bringing home eggs. Okay, there you go. So that's another stream of income. So now you have two streams of income. Um, 
fast forward a few years. Um, you're working a job, right? Um, you know, maybe you're you're blogging, you're doing something on the side where you're making some passive income doing that. Maybe we start turning these podcasts into something there profitable. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so I, I always love to use myself. For example, um, I, I'm probably one of the busiest kids for a 21 year old. But so I have a job. I'm a software developer for a company, right? Um, that's that's my day job, my internship. Um, I, I work at a golf course part time over the winter, usually once a month. During the summer, three to four times a month. Uh, I play guitar at restaurants um, at least, usually once or twice a month. Uh, I tutor. I give piano lessons. Um, just it adds up. All these different streams of income. Um, you'd, you'd be amazed that over a year, a few years, the difference in, in income that makes um, just aside, instead of doing one thing, doing a few different things to make some extra money, sure. um, how, that, how that helps you in the long run. So um, I, I think from young so, age, it's important to start so that. So under those circumstances, would you dedicate one or more streams to savings and then live off others? Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so... The, the idea of this is think, okay, well, maybe I play guitar at a restaurant twice a month. That's the money I could use to pay off all my expenses, right? And then the rest of it, I can just put right in the savings. Right. So I only have to get my spending money from one source. So that's that's yeah. the overall goal is to, to create those multiple streams and, and uh, of revenue and, and be able to allocate more of that to savings. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So we'll come back and we'll talk about how we can invest all that money we're making from all of our A's. Okay, so this question, the first question is basically, when should I start thinking about investing? Yeah, um, that, that varies for everyone. And I think that the, the concrete answer to that is as humanly young as possible, um, whether it's, it's mostly going to be through um, your parents, your, your dad, Joe, telling you about all this stuff, right? Um, you have a very big edge right now and a lot of other people your age, I'd say. Um, just for having this conversation, at least, and, and having um, your methods of saving. Um, as I said, I was 16 when I decided I, I really wanted to open my, my brokerage account and, and get into investing. That's really young. Um, you know, I, I think as soon as possible, as soon as you start understanding this concept, um, it's, it's great to, to start. And what's even better is to have the money set aside beforehand. So that way, when you're ready to go into action, you have everything ready for it. So Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is, what is the easiest way for a teenager get, to get involved with vest, investing? Uh, yeah, so um, I think for someone your age, it's great to do it through your parents. So um, that's going to be having your, your mom or dad set up your brokerage account for you, and we'll talk about what that is. Um, but they're going to be setting up all the, all the details for you, and you're going to be giving them the money. And you're going to say, okay... Um, you know, put this in my account and now you're not going to have to look at it. You're not going to have to worry about it because you know it's it's set and taken care of in place. Um, you're, you probably wouldn't be doing any any of that yourself until you're a little older. Um, I know that's what the case was for me. I wasn't, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm not moving things around right. um, for, for long-term investing at all. So I, I never really even need to look at it. But um, even though I do monitor it, um, you know, that's something that you're going to not need to worry about touching. So you're, you're going to want to do that uh, through your parents and have them set up that account, and, and it'll be all put in place for you. Okay. All righty. So the next question is, how do I know what is a good investment? Okay. Um, well, there's many, there's many different um, good investments, I should say. Um, to me, and for a kid, um, you know, a teenager, um, someone your age, a good investment is something that is safe, okay? You don't care about how much, what the, what the percentage you're making is a year. Um, you know, you don't care if you pick that, uh, you pick that investment that's going to make you a fortune. Um, you want the safest investment. A good investment to me is a safe investment, and that's how I invest um, my money. Okay. I don't focus, I mean, I mean, I do a lot of analytics, and, and I'm able to sometimes make swing trades and day trades and things like that just because that's what I do. I'm into it. Um, but good investing essentially is, is safe. And I agree. I I'm generally yeah. risk averse when it comes to my investments. And if I, if I yield 15 to 20%, right. I'm doing pretty good. Which with, is phenomenal by the way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's so phenomenal. I, I've, I've been very fortunate. So, and they're low risk yields that I have at this point in time. So, right. 
okay. diversity helps. Yeah, I mean, a good a, we've we've really only known our economy. Um, there was other than a, a slight uh, bear market in the end of 2017 or 2018. Um, we've only known a bull market these past five years. A bull market is is rapidly increasing. A bear market is rapidly decreasing. So bullish is good. Um, but um, you know, as you said, if you're earning 15 to 20 a year, it's phenomenal. Um, usually, with a good safe investment, you want to expect anything from five to ten. Yeah. So to have safe investments and to to be able to do even more than that, which most people, uh, a lot of people, have done uh, with this with this amazing market in the past few years, that's great. To to have a safe investment give a pretty pretty promising return. Yep. Yeah. Alrighty, so as a counterpart to the last question, what is a bad investment and what do I do I do if I have one? Okay. Um so bad investment I think is um not knowing what you're investing in. Um investing in a fund or whether it's an index fund which we'll talk about um or a company with without knowing what you're putting your money behind, right? Um you should never put your money behind anything or your even your word of mouth behind anything, right? Um, you wouldn't say you like something if you had no clue what it was. Um, so in, this, in the similar sense, you wouldn't want to put your money behind anything um, that you didn't know anything about it. Um, so bad investments, um, as we get older and start to, to start to study investing and whatnot, is buying it too high of value, right? Um, you know, buying something we're not familiar with or, you know, things like that. Um, again, I think you stay away from bad investments by um, not being a greedy investor, by being a safe investor, right? Because you, you're working hard for your money. Um, whether you're young or you're older, you're always working hard for your money, and you don't yeah. want to see it go away. Um, you want to you wanna make sure that you're putting your money where it belongs if, if you're going to be safe. So I think a bad investment is um, you know, something you're not informed about and, and something that can be a little more on the risky side. Okay, okay. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so the next question, we didn't answer this one, right? We did not answer this one, no. Okay, I'm just trying to <laughs> hopefully not get in. No, this is actually explaining how you make right. money. And, okay. and I must say, this, this is all makes sense so far. Um, you know, I'm trying to explain it in a little more simpler terms. Um, if you have any questions, always, always ask after I'm done, but, um, just want to make sure it all makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Good. So the next question is, how do you actually earn money from investments? Um, yeah, so to, to, to be really simple, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be um, you're buying it at a certain value, right? And then over time, whether it's a year or usually a lot more than that, uh, 10, 20, 30 years, um, you're going to be selling at a higher, higher price than you bought it at. And that's where you're going to be making your money is that margin in the middle. Um, there's also going to be um, dividends, which we'll discuss, which is which is money that the company pays you for owning their stock. Um, but funds also pay you dividends, not just not just individual companies. Um, so the money is going to be made when we're taking our money, we're investing it into a fund um, or a company, and then we're taking it out years later down the line at, at a higher price. And now that's that's when we officially make our profit. Um, unfortunately, we officially have to pay those taxes when we take it out, right. and, and that's where our money's made. So you, you buy a share of Apple at, I don't know, whatever astronomical price it's at. Now, let's say $100. Yeah. Okay. And then 10 years from now, that stock has gone up to $110, hopefully higher than that yeah. in 10 years. But yep. you sell it, you made $10. Yep. You pay the government half of that, probably. <laughs> and then you get to keep the other half. But that's how you that's how you make money through investing. Right. And now multiply that. Let's say you don't have one share of Apple. Apple, you have 70 shares. Now you're making a lot of money. Right. So that's that's why it's important to, um, you know, invest over time and, yep. and hold for a while. Yep. Okay. All righty. So the next question is, what are some things teenagers should look to invest in? Yeah, um, this is this is something that's extremely important because it's not investing isn't like a savings account where wherever you put it you're making money, right? right. Um, there's a lot of ways to lose money if you're inexperienced, and um, that's something that I went through. Thankfully, um, not a whole lot because um, I, I'm a very strong advocate of buy and hold. I don't like to to um, to sell to sell quickly. I, I think. The goal of investing is is long term, uh, the long the long game. Um, so things you want to look to invest for, um, I love to recommend ETFs. Um, an ETF is called an exchange trade fund. That's what it stands for. 
Um, that's a really complex term, I know. So all it is, is instead of investing in one company, you're investing in a ton of companies. So it's an average of all those companies. So it's going to be extremely safer because if one company, let's say, goes bankrupt or tanks or something like that, it's not going to affect the whole value of your portfolio a whole lot. It's just going to make a little dent in that in that value. Um, so that's where, where index funds are really, really great for long-term investments because um, with the right index funds, index funds that are going to um, measure the, the main markets in, in our economy, they're going to do what the market does. And if you have a fund that does what the market does, the market always goes positive in the long run. So that, that's what makes it a safe and sound investment. Um, so whether you're a teenager, um, which, which is a great question, or whether you're older, um, any index fund is, is going to be a phenomenal vehicle to, to grow your money without, without risk. Okay. And I think that that answers the follow-up question of, yeah. can I lose money in investing, which absolutely you can. Yes. Right. Yeah. If you, if you, let's say you bought Tesla, um, a couple of days ago, well, I, I apologize, but you lost a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so again, there, there are tons of ways to, to lose money. Um, and experience being probably the number one way I'd say, but, um, when, when a company, um, you know, when a company is going to lose value, it's not going to gain value. That's when you're going to lose your money. And I think the best way to avoid that is to not be investing in individual companies uh, when you're beginning, when you're starting to invest. You want to focus on index funds first. And then, you know, as you learn, as you learn more and start to, you know, look into companies' financials and, and their, you know, their their future plans and things like that, their, their overall goal, their objectives, um, you know, their revenue, things like that. Once you look into that stuff, then you can absolutely feel free to start investing in, in individual companies. But um, and, and it, which is great because as as we said, higher risk, higher reward, right? Right. Um, but but to start out, um, absolutely, index funds are going to avoid that risk. So, so I think we've asked and answered all the major questions we had. I did have some general questions here. I wanted to throw at you real yeah. quick. We're kind of pushing up against the clock here. Okay. Uh, but I wanted to kind of bring some of these terms full circle. That we talked about. Right. So we talked a lot about the market. What is the market? Right. So there's there's two major markets in the U.S. Um, the Dow, Dow Jones Industrial Average, and the S and P. Um, the Dow is going to be composed uh, of the thirty uh, the thirty uh, largest high uh, cap funds, um, which is I know a lot of terminology, and then the S and P, the top five hundred companies. So basically, what they are is averages, right? Five hundred companies in one fund. 30 companies in one fund. Um, that's what drives our nation's market. Um, that's what makes our economy good or bad. And that's what people, um, when they invest in companies, that's what those companies are a part of, right? Apple, Disney, um, you know, Tesla, you name it. They're, they're going to be, up, they're all a part of the, the Dow Jones, the, the average that drives our economy. Um, so that is, that's what makes index funds good over time. As that market goes up, as the Dow goes up, as the S&P goes up, um, so are those index funds that, that track those companies and track those indexes. So, Stocks and bonds, what are they? Yeah, um, stocks, I, I really, see, I, I never get in the bonds. Um, I, I'm more of a stock person, but um, a bond is going to be a lot safer, a lower rate of return. Um, they're going to be given out um, by usually a bank. They have government bonds, they have corporate bonds. Um, but basically, you're, you're giving money. Um, you're getting back a set interest rate, almost like a savings account, like a high APY savings account. Um, you're going to get kind of like a fixed rate back over time. Um, low return, le- a little less riskier than, than stocks. Stocks, again, um, you're going to be investing in a company, um, hoping to see profit over time, price go up and then sell. So stock is just uh, the value um, in one sentence. Stock is the value, I'd say, of a, of a company. So it's going to be um, you know, what that company is worth in, or, in the market. Or lack thereof when it comes to Tesla. Oh, geez, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know what? All the analysts were saying, you know, this is, and I 100%, 110% agreed that this was all just, price was driving up and yeah. it was all a bunch of bogus. It was, sure enough, well, it was yeah. overinflated. And, oh, yeah. You know, they're yeah. too subjected to the regulation at this point in time and every little setback they get kills them. It does, yeah. Very, very volatile company. Um. Elon Musk doesn't help either. <laughs> Love him, but like he's he's crazy. <laughs> yep. uh, money markets. What are money markets? Yeah. Um, so uh, money markets are, I guess, basically uh, higher kind of savings account. Um, banks offer them. Uh, credit lenders would credit unions would offer them. 
Um, they're, they're just accounts that are going to generate a lot less interest, so maybe well, like 2 to 4%, I guess. Okay. Um, I don't use them. I, as I said, I love the index funds. That's that's where pretty much all my money is. About 60% of my investments is uh, of my investments are in index funds, 40% in stocks. Um, but money markets are you know, just like in the probably like a higher APY savings account where, where you can – you know, put it put a fixed amount in and get a fixed percentage back. Um, different, just another different type of account, different type of investment vehicle. Um, you know, where you can grow your money. So, as you can see through this discussion, there are tons and tons of options. Yeah. Um, just in an hour discussion, right? So. So all right, dividends. We touched on it. What are they? And should should I look for stocks that offer dividends? Yeah, absolutely. Dividends are great. They're you know just. Uh, they're going to be what a company pays you essentially for for owning their stock, right? Um, and not just companies offer dividends, right? Index funds offer dividends. A couple of my favorite index funds pay pretty good dividends. Um, dividends are usually paid in pretty low amounts, like less than one percent or around one point five or less percent. But if you're owning a stock and you're making money with the stock, it's it's great to also make money off of of quarterly dividends. So, yeah. um, you know. I don't typically look for dividends, but it's a huge plus when when a company or um, like Apple's decent with dividends. Um, Disney pays them as well, I believe. Yep, Disney does. Um, so, th- so they're great. They're a little bonus for they're a little perk for for owning stock. So you in can a company. You can yeah. cash out dividends and take the money out. Right. Okay. Or yeah. what I do is I have my dividends reinvested yeah. into the stock itself. Right. So I own a little bit more of that stock when those dividends come out. Right, and that's the idea of kind of just. Adding fuel to the fire, right? Yep. Not just investing once and letting it sit there. Just keep adding to it, and, yeah. and that's when it really grows and uh, you know grows over time. So we've talked for about an hour and ten minutes about finance and financial responsibility, and haven't mentioned prime rate at all. Could you explain that? Yeah. So that's um, that is basically probably the ideal or best interest rate that you're going to receive on like a loan or something like that. Correct. Um, so, um, you can add in here a little bit if you want to, but the most, I guess the most credit worthy people are going to get, um, better rates as opposed to the non, right. Um, so your prime rate is yes. set by the federal government right. as to what they're lending money right. at. I think it's like five, yeah. some five and a half right now. Right. Percent. Yeah. So depending on how the economy is, that prime rate goes up and down. So when we were talking about, uh, uh, fixed mortgage or fixed loan or a variable, the variable is tied to the prime rate. Right. So it, you can usually get a percent less or so on a on a variable than a fixed, but if you know something happens to the economy and right. it drives that prime rate up two points, now you're paying more for that than right. you would have if you had a fixed rate. And the same even goes with dividends, right? It, it acts with the price of of the stock. So yep. just as it acts inversely, I guess with the price price of the stock. So if price drops a lot. Um, they might boost the dividends a little bit just to be giving you the around the same amount back and then vice versa. If uh, prices go up, they might drop the dividends a little bit so they're not giving you a crazy amount of money. Right. So, um, the prime rate in that sense kind of also acts uh, you know, together. Yep. Um, is investing really as simple as buy low, sell high? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think... There, there are obviously many different types of investing, but if you're if you're a safe investor, it shouldn't matter where you buy because your goal is to take it out years and years and years, 40, 50 years from now. Um, so it shouldn't matter if you buy low or sell high. Obviously, it is uh, better to buy low. Um, but if you're a long-term investor, absolutely. Um, you're going to want to put it in, take it out later in time. Um, you know, For the more risky stuff, um, it does get pretty complex with, with all different types of analytical tools to to measure relative strength and, and current value and things like that. Um, but, you know, I think buy low, sell high is, is just such a great principle to grasp if, if you're investing the safe way. And, sure. and, and what I think for, for the new, the new uh, investors is the right way. And, yeah. and the market is cyclic, you know, it's going to go up and it's going to go down. And if right. you catch it at the right time, it's better. Like I'll, I'll tell you when the market does go down, that's when I always buy because you're getting in at a little better rate than, than uh, what you typically would if it were a little higher, right? And that's what yeah. terrifies me buying now with everything, you know, the market, the, so the great. economy right. being so good right, right now, right. everything is up. Right. And when you're So you're waiting for that downtrend now. Right. Now, when you're an adult, um, that's something you have to worry about. Let's let's say you're a little closer to retirement um, and the market's really high and it starts to tank. 
you know, you're not going to have your money in an account for that much longer. Right. So you might want to be looking to take it out. Now, when you're young, that's a great buying opportunity. You want to buy more. Yeah. Um, you know, I could tell you, I could confidently 100% tell you, um, put your whole life savings in index funds. Um, you know, Vanguard, um, they measure the mega cap. Uh, so basically the larger cap companies in the market um, or mid cap, small cap measures the whole market in general, all these ETFs. So it's a safe investment, right? If you invest in those and it tanked 10% the next day, I'd say I still 100% stand behind what I said because by the time you take it out, you're going to have doubled, tripled, quadrupled your initial investment. So um, it's, it's important not to focus on the short, short term, but but look at the long term. So to sum up, what is the most important advice you could give a teen about financial responsibility? Um, I think that as a teenager, it is – even if it's not something that you think about every day, um, it's something that will be happening every day in the future, if that makes sense. So you're not going to have to worry about paying bills right now. You're not going to have to worry about buying a car right now, but one day you will. So if you can prepare for that now, it's so much better through investing, through budgeting, um, you know, through saving. The early, I think the number one thing about financial responsibility, um, you know, in teens and young adults is the earlier the earlier you prepare, the the more ready you're going to be when the time comes to 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 need those skills. So, I think that's awesome advice. We'll come back with some closing thoughts and close out the show. Great. So, Dan, I wanted to thank you again for coming in. I think it's been a fantastic discussion we've had yeah. here. I've learned a lot from it. How can people learn more about you and the financial fix? Yeah, Joe. Uh, thanks so much, Joe and Madison, for having me. I, I had a great time uh, recording this episode. Um, so The Financial Fix, you can visit the website, uh, the blog at thefinancialfix.co. Uh, we also are on Instagram where we're pretty active. Uh, it's just The Financial Fix um, on Instagram. Um, so we have tons of information on the website, tons of great information on Instagram um, where you can reach out to me at contactthefinancialfix.co. Um um, contact at the financial fix that dot co that is um, all that uh, information about contact and the emails on the website. Um, he also has it on the screen there for you. Um, so you can always feel free to reach out to me with any questions um, about the blog, about personal finance. Um, other than that, um, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed being on the show. I'm glad, uh, you know, glad we got to showcase the website and kind of talk about our, our uh, views on finance a little bit, uh, especially, um, it's interesting to talk about it with, with the younger generation because, yeah. you know, I think eight years ago, you know, that's where I was. I was in the same place as you just starting to learn this stuff. And you're even, I think a little ahead of where I was at that age. So, awesome. um, you know, having that information through dad, through yourself is it's definitely valuable. So, uh, that's, that's good. All right. Madison, yeah. any closing remarks? Um, I guess just for anyone, however old you are, it's important to be financially responsible, to have savings, um, to invest on certain things, and sorry, I'm a bit tired. <laughs> That's okay. I think you did great, yeah. sweetie. Hit the nail on the head there, and the, to learn about investing, I think, is, is uh, like you have, is extremely important, so... Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Great show. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. And uh, that's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. <laughs>